Hi everyone, this is Elias Martin from Collecting Japanese Prints. Welcome to Woodblock Wednesday, where every Wednesday we get together and discuss Japanese prints, paintings, culture, and history. I'd like to just say hello to all of the people who are self-quarantining and staying in place. I, uh, you know, I've been doing that for basically two months now, and um, you know, this morning. I gave myself a, a small trim um, and like worried about it looking all uh, weird, but those are the things we need to be doing uh, in order to stay safe and keeping everyone else safe. So um, I want to encourage all of you who um, have been doing a great job to continue doing that. There is a light at the end of the tunnel uh, and I'm sure all of us will have an opportunity to go outside and, and go back to our favorite restaurants and do our things that we normally love doing soon. But uh, we have to be careful because this month uh, will bring warmer weather here in the United States and we still have to be mindful of the situation that's in place here and think of others as, as much as we're thinking of the things we're missing ourselves. So just wanted to throw that out there. And um, so today, I want to discuss um, uh, important work that I have on my website. And I was inspired to do this uh, because I have a client considering um, this work. And I thought, well, if it uh, hopefully goes to a very good home soon, um, I should discuss it now before uh, it's gone and I won't be able to do that. So uh, today we're going to talk about the dawn of the Sosaku Hanga movement. Uh, which is an early 20th century movement um, of print artists who were inspired uh, by Yamamoto Kanai. He's the founder. And uh, he, uh, well, you know, it was his idea, uh, not unique to him. There had been some incidents uh, in Japan where artists produced their own prints. But by and large, he's credited with the, 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 the birth of the movement, uh, where he, his idea is carving one's own blocks and printing one's own prints to best capture the artist's ideas in, in printmaking. And so, um, you know, what I'll do is I'll, I'll, we'll go to the table and uh, discuss a couple of works uh, and I could get uh, more specific about that. So without further ado, let's go to the table and have a look. So we're walking over to my table here. And so uh, Yamamoto Kanai, uh, as I said, was the, the, the person who sort of originated or inspired the movement of Sosaku Hanga. And um, he created a print with, uh, well, here, let me pull, pull the print out that, that was published in his magazine. But he created a print um, in a process that it was in, in many ways unique um, um, at the time. He, he carved out the design with a, a, a particular type of chisel or, or, or woodworking device directly into the block as, as, he, as if he was drawing. And so he, he originally called, called this design a knife picture uh, because it really was imbued with the, the, the work of carving out the image in a way one might, um, you know, draw out a design on paper. So there was an immediacy to it. There was uh, the artist directly carving into the block uh, and, and imbuing that design, not just the, the, the ideas that the artist wanted to convey, but also the emotional temperament, all of the things that the artist wanted to, to imbue in his artwork was, it was, was achieved in this carving and subsequent printing. And one of the things I should mention that up until this point in time, Japanese prints and particularly Japanese art, the idea of art or an artist was actually quite new. And the, you know, the, the, the idea of, of these things were more the, uh, in, in the Japanese sort of history, art history, uh, they were more artisans producing um, what many would consider sort of decorative arts. And so there wasn't an emphasis on the artist himself or herself. 
uh, but in most cases it was, it was a man. Um, it was it was the production and the tradition of what they were producing, um, and so it, the idea of an individual artist having something to say um, in, in, in creating artwork to demonstrate that was sort of new. It was pretty new and it was really radical. There was an emphasis on the individual. Uh, and so, uh, so when we consider that, we, we could look at this print and, and think about how different it is from the, the prints that came before it and the tradition of woodblock printmaking. And, uh, and so I will show you a couple of prints uh, in a book that relate to this period. This was done basically in the Meiji period. And it, it was a period of, in Japan's history where there was a lot of influence from the West and a lot of ideas, or artistic ideas were coming in all at once. So it was a, it was a really interesting time for the artists. It was confusing, obviously, for so much information coming in that individuals had to sort through. But at the same time, uh, Yamamoto uh, he took that as an opportunity to advance sort of the, the, the power of the individual as an artist. And so I think it's kind of an interesting backdrop um, when you consider that this is the first work produced uh, by Yamamoto and technically the first work of Sosaku Hanga. And this print, as, as I said, was carved with a sort of a spontaneous and direct um, interaction with the wood block. In, in, and as you can tell, and I'll zoom in um, so you can see the image, you'll see how, how different it is, how expressive. Um, there's almost even a sense of movement, though the, the design is quite still. And that, that sense of movement is really the artist at work. You could kind of imagine him carving out this design. So uh, for a moment, I'll, I'll, I'll zoom in so you can see. What's, what's interesting in this design, I mean, I'm going to keep saying the word interesting because there's so many things uh, that are um, interesting about um, this period of printmaking. Um, but, but in this case, uh, what's, what, what's a radical departure as the design is created with just blocks of color and, and, and also the carving tool. There isn't an outline where the design it has been sort of achieved first and then colors printed over to, to create the design. Now, for example, I'll move, I've, I elected to pull out a book on Yoshitoshi, who is an amazing Meiji period artist. And these are two triptychs that are uh, on this particular page. And I'll refer back to this print in particular in a moment. But, you know, I want you to, to take note that in, in these prints, there is this, um, a black outline on anything, on everything. And the outline um, was printed first, and then the colors were printed in between the black outlines, almost as if, if you're filling in a page of a coloring book. And so you built up the design in that way. Uh, in this case, that's, that is, this is different. Uh, it, there is much more of a spontaneous, creative interaction with the wood block when you're carving the block directly. And, and in, in, in designing it, and, and maybe in some ways, Yamamoto had an idea of what he wanted, but as he was carving, he's, he's making the design. Where a lot of these uh, works were created after a watercolor or, or a painting, and they were you know, basically translated into a wood block. And Yamamoto designed prints as prints uh, in the process of making the prints. And so I, I don't believe he had a watercolor uh, design. Maybe he had a rough sketch of what he wanted, but it was the, the process of carving out the block that enabled to the image to emerge. Very different process. Um, and the focus is on the creative, um, the creative spontaneity and the, insp insp 
the power of inspiration in the moment of carving and as well as printing. And uh, but I, I'm putting an emphasis on the carving right now because that is that that's such a radical departure from what was Edo period Meiji these these in this case Meiji but earlier Edo period woodblock printmaking. So this is very very different. And in this in this magazine that was published by Ishi Hakute, uh, who was a friend of Yamamoto. And he, you know, Yamamoto made this design and Ishii Hakute was so enamored by it and enamored by the idea of, of the individual artist, which as, as I said, was a very new thing in Japan at this time. And th this magazine basically has a manifesto of what, you know, what the future holds for, for people interested in woodblock printmaking and in prints and visual culture. I mean, prints didn't necessarily represent um, just a way to communicate information about the news or, uh, uh, or for commercial purposes, you know, promoting a particular bathhouse or kimono line. It, it, was, it was directly addressing the issue of what the artist, him or herself, wanted to express. Uh, that was that was that was very new and and a radical departure, and so the the print I really want to focus on today is is really an important work. Um, it 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 is part of the body of work that Yamamoto produced when he he traveled to Europe for the first time. He was in his mid thirties, and um, he was able to organize a trip to Europe through a subscription service. So he, he acquired a group of subscribers who agreed to pay an X amount of money um, during his trip, which allowed him the ability to go to Europe. And he was producing these prints in Europe. And in some cases, from what I understand, they were shipped back to Japan to the subscribers. Um, and Yamamoto brought with him Japanese paper, Japanese wood blocks to carve the designs, but the, the designs of this period are not Japanese in subject. They are scenes that he experienced and saw firsthand in his travels. And if I may dare say, I think in his body of work, his, his European designs are his finest. And as, and as a collector, uh, it's also the, the rarest of the, of, of the prints that he produced, uh, partly because the number of subscribers that participated in this program were not as many as you might imagine. And estimates of, of how many subscribers, um, you know, I've heard as, as many as 30, but as little as 15 to 20. And, and so that means that the production of these prints were, was in very small amounts. I mean, we're, we're, we're talking about a handful of these. And in particular, when you think about the works that survive, not just the earthquake from, of 1923, this print was produced in 1913. So 10 years later, there was an earthquake that destroyed a lot of Tokyo. And then, of course, later, the bombings um, that, that occurred in Tokyo that basically destroyed most of the city. The, I would imagine the surviving impressions of, the, of these designs, probably, I could probably count them in either one or two hands. And in this particular uh, design, this is Bathers in Brittany. It was done in 1913, and it's printed on this really interesting Japanese paper. And you can tell, um, that it's Japanese. I might be able to flip it over because of the the quality of the paper. The, the, the paper itself is very nice. It's very strong. Japanese paper is known to be very strong, made with kozo um, fibers or fibers from the mulberry uh, bark. And and so you could see the fibers in here and there. But the, the interesting thing is the paper itself, as Japanese prints go, was not as the, the highest quality of paper. They're actually, if, and I'll zoom in, there's inclusions, little inclusions from the mulberry bark that are in the paper. And the finest quality paper do, does not have inclusions. 
And so we know that uh, Yamamoto did not have much money to produce these prints. So he used paper that he could afford. And in this case, there's these inclusions. And you see these inclusions in different places on different impressions from, from prints of this period. So that's actually kind of fascinating. Uh, the other thing I want to point out about this print is there's no margins. Usually, you know, we, we've gotten used to seeing a white border around prints, particularly Edo period prints. And these early Sosako Hanga designs, particularly the works that he produced in Europe, um, don't have margins. Um, there's another print of this same exact size of a cow. Um, also a Brittany uh, design and along a, a shore. It's ex done in the same format. And the reason why is that he didn't have much paper. He had to be very judicious on how he used his paper. So he designed prints that were, that were basically smaller than what uh, one was used to during the Edo period. And the lack of margins help, helped him um, save on paper as well, I would imagine. So it's a, it's a fascinating study of these early Sosaku Hanga prints and how artists decided to produce their work. Now, um, I'm going to zoom in so you could see the design. Uh, so what we have here are women that are bathing, and there's this really beautiful little maybe lagoon or a little area of water that fills up by, from the ocean, and there's these rocks and here's a, a woman who may be coming in to, to, to take a dip herself or maybe bringing, you know, towels or something. And, um, and it's fascinating because the way that it's printed, the texture of the paper uh, inter intermingles with the printing and the colors that create a really wonderful atmospheric design. And you see this effect on these early period prints. I think I think they're all really wonderful for that. Um, and you know, I'm going to zoom in so you could kind of get a sense of the texture, which is wonderful. the The other noteworthy um, thing I could say about it, in, about this design in terms of how it's produced, is there is no black outline at all whatsoever here. The, the, this, is, this design is built on blocks of color that have been carved out and printed. And in some cases, um, the, the color that's been printed over other color to create a deeper, richer effect. That is a, a Sosaku Hanga effect that was really pretty much uh, started, I won't say invented, but it was popularized by Yamamoto. And other artists soon um, adapted that technique of printing color and color without these key block outlines. And that gives the print a much more expressive quality. And it's, I also, he think, uh, you know, he was greatly influenced by European artists who ironically enough were influenced by Japanese artists. And, you know, we'll get to that, but I want to, at this point, I'm going to move this print over so you could see it compared to, you know, this subject um, of bathers is, is not something new. It's something that is is inherently found in, in all cultures. And here we have a Japanese artist encountering this subject that I'm sure he saw by artists who were in Brittany, like Gauguin or Cezanne in particular. And in here, you, I'm just taking this print for example. This is uh, Beauties at a, at, a, um, you know, at a spa, at a bathhouse, and you see them bathing. And this, this print was made 30 years before this design. And if you look at Edo period prints, if you go 30 years back from this point, they pretty much look about the same. Of course, there'll be nuances in color that will be different. The style might be slightly different, but not a whole lot um, you'll notice in terms of the, the, the actual design and how it's produced. Here, this is radically different. There is a, a, a strong line drawn in the sand, 
and in a departure from the tradition that was established during the Edo period. And the lines that would have been built up or carved out to, to bring out this design a bit more, like in these two examples, are gone here. And it's just the color um, working in concert with the texture of the paper, working with the design itself that really convey the emotion and the feeling. And the, the figures aren't extremely realistic. I mean, they're, they're flat in the sense that that's very a strong aesthetic choice that Japanese uh, print artists used in the past. But they're, 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 the forms are in some ways suggesting um, what is happening instead of creating a precise image of it, which gives, again, an, an impressionistic quality that I'm sure Yamamoto was um, noticing in Europe. Now, it's interesting to note that he, he in his travel journal noted that he wasn't a big fan of a lot of, of European artists uh, and didn't really understand some of them. But at, at the same time, one has to think about some of the, the, the paintings that uh, Yamamoto um, for, saw firsthand. And they definitely created an influence or a filter for, for his artistic aesthetic as it, it was building. And, you know, so again, the, these forms uh, of the women here are oh, not abstract, but very suggestive, very loosely drawn and printed. Um, and I shouldn't say drawn, but rendered um, in a way that I actually think they're, they're quite beautiful and expressive. And, and you really get a sense of what is happening here uh, on this day. Um, it leaves a lot more to the eye of the viewer to put together, which I, I think is more compelling, um, personally, than, than, than the, the alternative. Um, granted, Edo period artists were, were masters at being able to produce these designs in a careful, meticulous sort of way, which is very satisfying to print collectors. And I get that. And I love those prints as well. But we have to look at early 20th century prints with a different eye than, than the, the eye that looks at the meticulous carving of late Yoshitoshi prints or even Edo period prints of Hiroshige and Hokusai. Um, we, we, we don't look at Sosaku Hunga with the same eyes. We, we, we look at this early 20th century printmaking almost with the eyes you, one would look at a, a Cezanne. And so, you know, mentioning Cezanne, I thought it would be an interesting, um, here, let me, okay. So here we have a painting that's uh, found at the Met. And it's by Cezanne, and it was produced, I think in the 18, here, hold on, let me, let me see if I could get a, a date for, for all of you. So they have a date here of 1874 uh, to 75. And this happens to be the very first um, painting by Cezanne that uh, featured bathers. In, in his in his paintings. And I picked this design intentionally because the the work has a very loose, expressive quality that uh, has been built up by 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 thick but quick applications of of oil painting. And what is missing in this painting is a strong outline. You know, it, it, again, it's expressionistic. So it's not about the detail. It's about the feelings that the colors in concert with forms um, invoke in the, in the uh, viewer. So when you look at this, and excuse the glare, but when you look at it, you could really see the difference um, in what I'm discussing. It's not realistic. It is impressionistic. It is, it is a, a moment, almost kind of a memory. You're thinking back, and uh, Yamamoto's prints, I believe, owe a bit to this. And yeah, they've been translated into woodblock printmaking, where it's it's harder to convey 
that sort of that soft, um, expressive feel in printmaking, but I think Yamamoto does it, and he and he does it very successfully uh, without the use of the black outline and with a use of you know these expressive colors that are printed on top of each other working in concert with the composition and of course this paper so all of this is working extremely well together to create this uh stunning uh design so for i'm going to zoom in i'm going to stop talking for a bit so that um you can all see the print And what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip this over if I can if, with one hand, and I want to show the the verso. So this is this is the back of the print, um, and you can see the colors bleeding through to the um, the the front as well. And it's interesting um, the way that the print reads from the the reverse. It makes me it makes me think that I wonder when I was looking at this. I wondered if uh, Yamamoto was thinking. When he was carving, whether he was carving the the inverse, um, or if he was thinking of the design as if it was finished, it's just an interesting sort of idea that you know crossed my mind, um, because I th I think the composition works interestingly both ways, um, the looking at it this way as well as that way. So relating it back to this um, this painting, what's what's fascinating is you know Cezanne, Gauguin, Monet, Manet, all of these artists were very interested in Japanese aesthetics. They they were interested in Japanese prints and, and paintings because it, they represented a new or radical way of looking at reality or or, or art. Um, that mimics reality, and so the 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 prints that they were looking at were Hiroshige and Hokusai and Toyokuni the Third and and other artists. And what they liked about those prints is these these areas of flat color um, that that and and the perspectives that weren't really accurate. They were sort of imaginary in some ways, and and they basically these prints sort of released artists from producing artwork that was representative of the world exactly and it made inspired them to turn inward and to represent images not necessarily as one sees them but how one experiences them um, and so that that's that's really fascinating um, and, and when we look at their artwork you know I think I, I'm thinking if I can think correctly, it might have been uh, Manet who said that without Japanese prints, um, Impressionism would never have occurred. And so it, it's very interesting to consider that. And it's also interesting to think on how the, the winds of influence carried from Japan to Europe and then from Europe back to Japan. And um, the early Sosaku Hanga artists that traveled to Europe, like Yamamoto, they were re-inspired, or their their the desire to make prints was um, reinforced by by noting how important um, the or how high, high, how highly esteemed Japanese prints um, were considered in Europe, and Yamamoto came back to Japan. And said, "Well, no, yeah, this form is is in many ways native to the Japanese, and we should, you know, begin working in earnest, making designs that not that are not necessarily designs for commercial purposes in the sense that one is trying to sell, you know, a kimono or a particular kabuki play, but that this art form that is inherently." Japanese can be served to uh, can be served as an expressive tool 
for the Japanese artists to convey their inner world, their frustrations, their hopes, their desires, their fears in in a artwork in a form that was understood but with imagery that was challenging and compelling. And so, you know, this is this these are the issues, these are concerns for early 20th century printmakers of the Sosaku Hanga period and um and this particular print from 1913 is a very important, significant work that d directly relates to all of that and illustrates this, this struggle of breaking free um, from the old paradigm of Edo and Meiji period prints into sort of a, a new vision of, of art. So I'm going to zoom in again to look at these both prints so you can get a really good sense of how they're made. And in future episodes of Woodblock Wednesday, I'll discuss the role of Sosaku Hanga magazines. They were very important um, in order to sort of continue the tradition and distribute ideas, artistic ideas across the country. And, you know, I'll, I'll be able to discuss that with the actual magazines themselves. But for today's purposes, I wanted to point out that it's, it's not a coincidence that the first Sosaku Hanga print um, was included in a magazine that was, you know, that contained a manifesto or a treatise on on the the role of the print artist as an individual artist. Um, I, I think that's that's a fascinating um, uh, occurrence that makes sense when you think of the tradition as it un unfolds through throughout its uh, history. And again, Bathers and Brittany from 1913. Well, I hope you enjoyed having a look at some, some two very important works. They're very rare, in fact, and so it's a privilege to be able to share them with you. Um, the work by early Sosaku Hanga artists, particularly by Yamamoto Kanae, uh, I think gets overlooked quite a bit, partly because the, the material isn't out there. Uh, it's locked in museums across the, the, the globe, and every so often they're pulled out for exhibitions. They're certainly in reference books and in, in history um, uh, books discussing the period. But as collectors, one's interest is always motivated by what's out there um, in the marketplace. And because his work is so scarce, uh, I think that his, he gets overlooked a, a little bit. And so it was a joy to be able to share some fantastic pieces with you, all of you. And, uh, you know, feel free to comment in the video uh, below uh, on any questions or, or connections you might make with other artwork, particularly European artwork of this period. And, um, you know, I'll be very curious to hear what everyone has to say. Uh, feel free to private message me with other questions that you feel more comfortable uh, sending private. Uh, that's great. That's fine. And, um, and I'll be doing other videos about Sosaku Hanga in the coming weeks, of course. Uh, so if there are things you'd like to see or artists you'd like uh, for me to feature, please go ahead and send me a note. I will certainly do that. So thanks all of you for joining me on Woodblock Wednesday. Please stay safe and I look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks.